it is a privilege, and I say it truly, that it is a privilege for me uh, to be here, to speak um, to the priests of this diocese. I'm in the midst of writing a book on this topic, but also, much of what will be said today, it comes out of experience that I've had over the last 26, 26 years doing um, ministry, or evangelization on university campuses. 26 years ago, my wife and I started up a movement called Catholic Christian Outreach. And basically, it's a university student movement. It started in the University of Saskatchewan. And its main purpose was to reach out into the university and find those Catholics who have wandered away. And we're talking <coughs> millions upon millions upon millions of young people who have walked away on our university campuses. And so our job, our mission, what we felt God was calling us to, is to go onto the university campus and bring them back. And 26 years ago, uh, there was a lot of skeptics um, feeling that young people don't want to come back. They might come back later, but they're not interested in coming back. But we experienced a different story, a different reality, that actually young people want to come back. And I'm talking about those who wandered away. I'm not talking about the faithful, but those who have wandered away, who no longer go to, to Mass, who do, don't really, uh, aren't connected with the church. They are only waiting for an invitation. And so we've built a movement um, that is focused in on reaching them and bringing them back. And we've, we're now, right now, across Canada, from Victoria all the way to Newfoundland, and we're seeing thousands of students come back. It's, it's really a glorious time, although you have to have eyes of faith to see it. But there's something special happening today <coughs> Um, that that I think is the result of the Great Jubilee, but I won't get into, into all that. But there is something happening, and we're seeing it, we're witnessing it on university campuses, and then when they leave, their integration into the church once they leave. We're also in, in different countries, but one of the countries that we're focusing in on at this particular time in the last three to four years has been Uganda. Uh, we have seven universities there that we're on, and we have three full-time uh, Ugandans that are, are running uh, the ministry there. So it's an exciting time, um, but again, what I will be sharing with you today is coming out of that experience. So it's not, uh, what I'll be talking about is not theoretical, but it's a reality. It, it, what I'm sharing with you, it works. But not only at a, uh, at a university level, but we're seeing it work um, um, very effectively at a parish level also. Because the message that we're going to be talking about is universal. It's not only directed towards um, a younger generation or older generation. Uh, it's, it's to every person. So I'd like to begin um, and I, with an introduction. And the introduction is kind of, well, it, it'll be, I want to communicate what my purpose is for today. And my ultimate purpose for today is to speak of evangelization, the process of evangelization. I used a big word like pedagogy. Basically, the process, systematic process of evangelization, which begins with the proclamation. And we're well aware of that. It's a proclamation of the gospel. A proclamation of the charismatic gospel. Jesus, birth, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. So I'll be talking about that proclamation. But evangelization is more than just a proclamation. Evangelization, understood, is an invitation that 
the full process of evangelization should be inviting the hearer to respond. And so today, that's where I'm going to be spending most of my energy, is on the response. On how we bring people into that experience. But I also like to approach it, not just me standing up here and speaking to you, I'm going to, and I want this to be a dialogue. I want your feedback, your questions, I want, I want to hear what you have to say and then build upon that. It'll be a dialogue between you and I about this evangelization process from proclamation to response. There is a crisis out there. We know that about 15 to 18 percent of Catholics actually go to church at least once a month. That is the present reality. But, and I'm taking a lot of my information from Sherry Waddell's book, um, in, uh, Forming Intentional Disciples, a great, great book that speaks, that uh, pinpoints the problem. But in her book, and there's other books that are just confirming exactly what she's saying, but she kind of goes a little further, and in her experience in uh, leading retreats with priests and bishops and catechists, is that she's discovered from their feedback, is that, and she's asked the question, but out of those 15 to 20 percent, let's just say 15 percent of those that actually go, 5 percent of that, that 15 percent actually are engaged, that are intentional disciples, that their lives have been transformed. They're doing it not out of cultural reasons, but out of, out of conviction. One could say that only 1% of Catholics are engaged. We've lost 99% of our people. That is a crisis. Well, I know when I was growing up and what I had heard earlier on in this kind of exodus, um, is they will come back. They will come back. When they get married and or when they have children, they'll come and get their children baptized or they get married and then they'll, they'll see a need. You know, they, they've kind of went out there and lived kind of the, the high life. Now they'll come, you know, back. There's no evidence that that is a reality. There's no there's no data out there that would suggest that this is going to happen. It's actually the opposite. They have no intention of coming back. No intention. But why is it that they're gone? It's not real to them. That they aren't experiencing it. It's not life-giving. It's not relevant. They don't see why. They're disconnected from it. There's no attraction to it. They are not been captured by it. So all the, the fancy, loud music and everything that we do, which is good, uh, but the balloons and the celebration is not what they're looking for. Because the world offers a lot more lights and excitement and and a lot more energy than we can. So why they're leaving is because it means nothing to them. They walk away fairly easily with very little guilt. But there is hope. There always is hope. If there's no hope, let's close up our books and walk out and drink and be merry. There is hope. Abundance amount of hope. And in a particular way today, there, again, Sherry Waddell is the one that reminded me of this, but there's a study done to those who have walked away, the wanderers, or those that no longer identify themselves as practicing. And there's a study that showed um, that Francis effect, that 5% of those people who no longer go, would consider coming back. 
5%, if we're talking millions, which we are, just in North America, we're talking, that group of people is actually the largest religion in the world. They call them the nuns. They don't have any religion. That are ex-Catholic. They're the largest congregation in the world, in, in North America. But out of that group, 5% would consider coming back. Just imagine if we could just get, you know, 3% of that 5%. Our numbers would explode. So there is hope that people are actually wanting to come back. But also, what to me, um, the statement from, from uh, St. John Paul II has always been an inspiration to me that uh, we are going to win this battle, that, that we are in a, in a missionary age in the church, which is referred to the springtime of Christianity. He says in, um, in paragraph three of Mission of the Redeemer, he says, God is opening before the church the horizon of a humanity more fully prepared for the sowing of the gospel. The moment has come to commit all the church's energies to a new evangelization. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid the supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all people. St. John Paul II was a prophet that was able to see something in the future. And what he saw in the future was a humanity more fully prepared for the sowing of the gospel. He saw a time where people, our neighbors, those who have wandered off, will, will be ready to receive the gospel. And because of that moment, he sees in the future, he says, it's time for us, and by the way, you are the leaders of that, you've given everything to it, to this sowing of the gospel, and he's saying, the time has come, let's put all our energies in going and reaching them, bringing Christ to all people. This statement is um, exploding with hope, overflowing with hope if we read it with eyes of faith. The new evangelization is a means to get those who have wandered off and bring them back in. That's what it is. If we embrace the new evangelization, basically we embrace a mission of getting those who have wandered off, and many of them are in our parishes, by the way. They may be, they're physically there, but their hearts have wandered off. So it's our opportunity to you know, engage them, but also to reach the others. What I would like to do is I'd like to begin with um, a quote from one of the proposals of the Synod on the new evangelization uh, a couple of years ago in Rome where uh, Pope Benedict invited all the bishops of the world to come and to talk about the new evangelization. And at the end of the synod, as you well know, uh, they have a propositions that they, proposals that they offer to the Pope and the Pope is to write something about it at the end and then we have a great document. And this is one of the proposals, which is my favorite, and I'm going to kind of build um, this a whole presentation on this quote. Now, I can read it, but I would like you to just take two minutes, three minutes, and to read it yourself. And I'd like you to read it if you have a pen. I want you, I've circled, uh, I've underlined a few things, but I would like, if you want to recircle that one, the ones, the words, and um, the, the, some of the things that are said that stand out for you. So take about two, three minutes to read it slowly and circle or underline keywords. Okay, what are, what are some words that you underlined or that impressed you, um, stood out for you? Here. Living in county, the fact of you know, something that's not uh, stagnant, but also relational because an, an encounter is meeting somebody, so something that's relational. So yeah, the encounter, the relationship, yes, very good. Anything else? Message of salvation. Message of salvation, the initial proclamation, the good news, very good. Proclamation with the uh, spiritual power. Oh, that's my favorite uh, line in that is, I just have to read it. Uh, Father, why don't you read it because it's that one part. 
I mean, this is this is just speaks of the potential that um, the transformation that happens. Wow. Uh, the first proclamation is where the charisma, the message of salvation of the Paschal Mystery of Jesus Christ is proclaimed with great spiritual power to the point of bringing about repentance of sin, conversion of hearts, and the decision of faith. Wow. Huh? There's a new language that is found in that, that, um, that paragraph. Not new in that it's new, but it's almost being revisited, re-understood in today's cultural context. There's, there's new ways of saying things and inviting people to respond. And Pope Francis actually, in Evangelii Gaudium, talks about his dream. In the middle of the, actually the beginning of the doc, he talks about a dream. And one of his dreams is that there be, you know, a new um, um, missionary impulse within the church. And everyone, uh, the whole church would be oriented towards this mission. But he says in it that there would be, he hoped that there would be such a great transformation that there would be many changes that would happen. And one of them he referred to that even language would even change within the church. The way we say things in order to be able to speak to a world that has wandered off. And new in the fact that, that it's being emphasized. Let's talk about a relationship, the whole idea of a relationship that leads to conversion. St. John Paul II talked often about this relationship, but I just want to quote something from Mich uh, Redemptoris Missio. That's my Latin for today. The initial proclamation, the first thing that people need to hear is the gospel. Christ is risen from the dead. And so he talks about this initial proclamation has a central and irreplaceable role since it introduces man, the wandering man, into the mystery of love of God who invites him into a personal relationship with himself in Christ and opens a way to conversion. So the initial proclamation that it's an invitation for people to experience a personal relationship with Christ. A personal, intimate relationship with Christ. In Germany, in 1992, he makes a similar comment, but I think it's even more focused. It is necessary to awaken again in believers a full relationship with Christ, mankind's only Savior. Only from a personal relationship with Jesus can an effective evangelization develop. I invite you to enter into that language. We are messengers inviting people into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A personal relationship that, as he suggests, leads, way, leads the way to conversion. Uh, the church goes a little deeper. The encounter, again, Father mentioned that, that leads to conversion. So not only is it an invitation to be close to Jesus, but it's inviting to experience an encounter. Pope uh, Benedict talked about, like, we are inviting people not to just uh, to theology, but to an event, to a person. And so, in the document leading up to the to the Synod on the New Evangelization Instrumentum Laboris. Wow, that's an attractive language there. Um, it says, the first chapter, this is a document preparing the bishops for the, the Synod. The first chapter is dedicated to rediscovering of the heart of evangelization, namely, the experience of Christian faith. The encounter with Jesus Christ. After this encounter, everything is different as a result of metanoia. That is a state of conversion, strongly urged by Jesus himself. In a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, faith takes the form of a relationship with him. The first chapter gives particular attention to this fundamental aspect of evangelization because the responses to the lenimenta 
reported a need to re restate the core of the Christian faith, which is unknown by many of many Christians. So he's speaking of an encounter, a powerful encounter that changes lives. Why do people wander? Walk away so easily? It's because it's not real. It's not personal. It's not an encounter in their life. We have the opportunity to invite them into that encounter so that it becomes real. Everything changes once they encounter the living Lord. This has to be central to our mission. <clears throat> in Lumi Fide, am I saying it right? It's uh, Pope Francis' first document, but it really be Pope Benedict's um, document. He just he just said a few things at the end, but he says, faith tied as it is to conversion is the opposite of adultery. It breaks with idols to turn to the living God in a personal encounter. Believe, believing means entrusting oneself to a merciful love which always accepts and pardons, which sustains and directs our lives, and which shows its power by the ability to make straight the crooked lines of our history. Basically, again, it's a personal encounter that changes lives. I don't think we can overstress how important a changed, converted life is to the life of faith. Any comments to this point? Thank you, Juan. I, I'm going to give you something you had said earlier, and I'll come a little bit backwards a little bit. But you had talk, talked about people who had left and to come back. I had an experience with somebody who worked always on Sunday because he owned his own business as a, and all of a sudden he has cancer, and he wants to come back, but he's afraid because what do people think? Now that he's got cancer, he's coming back. That idea that they, there's a fear of what other people will think. Well, you know, he's, he's correct. This, this man is afraid to come back because are we a missionary community that recognizes that our existence is to bring the wandering back? Or do we judge them saying, oh, we're worthy all the way? Well, now, you know. So in our mind, we're saying, oh, like, okay, now he's faithful? But if we have a mind, we should almost, when he comes in, we should bow down. We should celebrate. We should have a fatted calf and celebrate the man who was blind can now see. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. We should celebrate them coming back. But we don't, we don't, our communities don't even know what it means to come back. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. Yes, back there. I'm a retired before it's some experience, of course, but I notice that the emphasis that you place on personal encounter with Christ, I think this is the crux of the challenge for us. So we have perhaps catechized to some degree. We have sacramentalized enormously, but in a way, our people have not connected to Christ. And this is our problem. I've, for, for many years, I've always agonized over baptizing children, very lovely children, from couples whom I never saw before, barely saw for, and never saw afterwards. How can we go on sacramentalizing without just having an encounter with Christ? To me, this has been for 52 years a challenge as a priest. And if I go back to way back 52 years ago, it was a different world, of course, in the church. But today, I feel that you have hit it on the head of school. Our challenge is how do you awaken within the hearts of our believers this enthusiasm for Christ? I've, you, we've all met former Catholics, became evangelicals, and they're all fired up for Jesus. How is it that we can't do that? Father, this is my goal for today. This is not theoretical. I appreciate what you're saying. And I'm going to invite you into the encounter today. You're going to be invited to that encounter. Let's go to the next page, which is inviting, inviting our response. Now, this is a proclamation. 
Christ is being proclaimed. <coughs> Inviting you to encounter this into a personal relationship. So I am proclaiming from, a, uh, from the, uh, the heights of a building and top of a mountain, I'm proclaiming uh, Jesus is risen from the dead. But as we learn, when Peter, the first vicar of Christ, did have his first sermon, <coughs> people were cut <coughs> to the heart. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And G, uh, Peter said, I don't know. I have no idea. I'll get back to you later. Just hang around and I'm sure it'll, it'll happen. No. He was clear. Does anyone, I'm sure you know what he said. What was his first line? What? Repent. Repent. That's the first thing is repent. We kind of got it backwards. We baptize and then hope we get repentance after. But we should be inviting them to repentance. And repentance is a response. It's not. It's an active response. It's not a passive receiving. Do you understand? It's acting upon something. When I repent, I'm putting my body, soul, spirit into it. My intellect. People need to know how to respond. You need to know how to respond. Now, a relationship, we, we all know we're created for a relationship, weren't we? God, the, the, the Trinity, is you know, the eternal, the manifestation of relationship, isn't it, huh? Mm -hmm. A constant, and this is the way we experience it, by the way, on earth, right here today, a relationship with you is I give you love and respect. But a relationship is realized, or love is relationship, is when you return it. You have to receive it and then return it. Isn't it true, huh? Can you imagine if a relationship was one-sided? I love you, I love you. Agape love. God loves everyone, huh? And it's easy if I just say, I love you all, to be indifferent based on that, huh? Some of you might say, oh, Andre loves me. Oh, that meant a lot. But most of you, it sets up for you to walk away indifferent because, sure, you're like. <laughs> but if I say, I love you, Father. I love you. What is your name, Father? Raymond. Father Raymond, I love you. I care for you. It changes everything, doesn't it, huh? That love is not just agape, which God loves us all, but now with you. Now we've just entered into the realm of relationship because he has a choice right now, doesn't he, huh? He can receive it and return it or walk away in fear or have a hardened heart. But there's no room for indifference here, huh? Relationship does not allow indifference. Re relationship, meaning my active wanting a relationship with somebody, does not allow for indifference. It allows for a hardened heart, or fear, or entering in. But the key to relationship, for the extent of relationship to really be realized, is that it is a giving, like we learned from the, the Trinity. It's a constant giving, receiving, giving, and receiving. Do you, do you understand? Like, it's giving back. It's, it's, it's like, I love you, I love you. It's constant back and forth. It's not one-sided. God does not just love us all. He's calling us to love him back. And the only way we can do that is when it's now directed to you. I know the hairs in your head. There's lots. <laughs> Do you understand? It's personalized. That's the essence of relationship. If we want to speak of a personal relationship, every person in, in 
that we meet, they have to know if we want to evangelize them, they have to know that that message is for you. Jesus is saying to you. That's essence of relationship. Take that out. It's just theology. This is a truth of God. But a relationship is inviting them to respond back. An invitation a relationship offers. The, 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 the greatest sign of that relationship is found in marriage. And we learn from, uh, we learn, uh, Paul talks about in the, uh, Ephesians 5, 31. We've all read this. I mean, you notice I'm not taking all the rest of five, chapter 5 of Ephesians because that's when often is difficult to uh, preach on, I'm sure you know. Uh, but he says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Marriage, the two coming one. Not just one imposing on the other. Do you understand? It's not just a man imposing himself upon a woman. No, the two become one. They, they both come together and they, they accept each other. And he says, he said, this is a great mystery and I'm applying it to Christ and his church. Basically, we're being taught that the way marriage, and a person that speaks a lot about this is actually Christopher West. If you want to read about, about this, this great sign that's found in marriage, Christopher West is excellent because he talks about it, he really breaks it down. But when we see marriage, that the response we see in marriage is actually the way we are to, to respond to God. It's a great sign. It's a, great, it's, it's a road map to encounter, to relationship. Because when we're talking about a relationship with God, we're not talking about a casual Sunday experience. Our relationship, and Paul stresses this, the church teaches about it, the saints give testimony to it, is that I live no longer for myself, but for Christ who died for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Meaning, what the relationship we're called with God is supposed to be the highest relationship, the most intimate, life-transforming relationship that we have here on earth. And so marriage is a great sign, or a great template on how to do that, we can learn much about marriage. So I would like to go right into the marriage ceremony to speak of this, how we respond. And I'm not making any, any um, suggestion that what I'm about to share is a sacrament, I meaning compares to the sacrament, but we can learn from the, the marriage ceremony what is actually going on. I'm really excited about this. So, in the catechism, we learn, uh, uh, you know, we read through the marriage ceremony. We learn uh, in um, 1625 and, and forward. So, what I'd like to do is I'm going to break it up in three kind of um, sections. The first section is we're going to learn that a relation, in, in con we're talking about a personal relationship here. The key to a personal relationship we're going to learn is choice is indispensable. Okay? Mark that down in your mind. Choice is indispensable. So let's read. The parties to a marriage covenant are a baptized man and woman, free to contract marriage, who freely express their consent. To be free means not being under constraint, not impeded by any natural or ecclesial law. The church holds that the exchange of consent between the spouse to be the indispensable element that makes the marriage. Indispensable element that makes the marriage. If consent is lacking, there is no marriage. The consent must be an act of the will of each of the co contracting parties, free of coercion, of grave external fear. No human power can substitute for this consent. If the freedom is lacking, the marriage is invalid. Now, we need to break this down. This isn't just ecclesial law. This isn't canon law. There's actually a truth here that we can learn from about what it means to relate to God. 
Why is it invalid? Why is a marriage invalid if there's no consent? Go ahead. Well, why can't you force it? So you're saying you can't force a relationship? We can, but we don't. I think you can't force a relationship. You can't force a relationship of love, okay? I can, I can force you to eat pizza all your life. I can force you to run a marathon. I can force you to stay up for like five or six days. But I can't force you to love me. That's, you only have the power to do that. You can only love me. Go ahead. I think, uh, you know, this is a question of intention. Uh, what we have is something like that. Even in the giving of the sacrament, if the intention of the, this is not the, I would say also, it goes to the contracting parties in marriage. If the intention is not there, it was lying. Yeah, very good. Any, any other reason? Why isn't it valid if there's no consent? What we learned here is that you can't force love. You can't force relationship. Well, the very essence of relationship, it has to be consenting. It has to be consenting. It also has to be free of fear. Meaning I can't, I can't love you out of fear. How often, how many of, uh, the, uh, of our people come to church because of fear. A fear that if I don't do this, if I don't say my rosary, if I don't go to, to Mass every day, if I don't go on Sunday, if I don't do this, that somehow my life, <coughs> I'll be punished for it. Fear is a great motivating factor, but it's not a relationship. If we're going to talk about a relationship with God, it cannot be driven by fear. But also, so it can't be coerced, meaning I can't say, you have to marry him. You have to go to church on Sunday. You better be following the Ten Commandments. You better be praying. Okay, I'll do it. Everybody has to show up at the, the parish uh, feast day. If you're going to be a good member, you have to be there. Coercion. All, every Catholic better be, by the way, I, I think these are all good. You know, I'm not making any comments on the importance of getting people and feast days and, and, um, and days of obligation are really good. But you better come to the church. It's an obligation today. That's void of love. It's not that's not love, that's not relationship. This is important, obedience is important. But there's something deeper here that we need to understand. That marriage, to be legitimate, it has to be freely accepted. We have to give consent to it. Do you understand? Are we clear on that? Yeah. It is essential. If we want people to really have a relationship with Christ, it has to be consented. <clears throat> and we're going to talk more about that. I'll, I'll challenge, well, you just said that sure. word there, but mm -hmm. to be accepted, I go further and say to be given. What do you mean? Well, there is an invitation, you accept the invitation, but in, in marriage, like it's this, this mutual giving, um, that to me almost precedes the invitation. I, I don't know how they express it there, but um, oh, for sure, it's not just I accept your love. Like it's because I love you that it's there. That's that's exactly what I'm talking about. There, there's a consent there. Uh, I, I fully agree. I fully agree. But it has to be an act of giving and taking. And there's a reason why I'm saying all this. Okay, because. What we're doing um, in about 20, 25 minutes is that we're going to be looking at is I want you to understand why this is important. So I'm going to kind of move a little quicker because I, I want to move through this. Is conversion means 
accepting by personal decision, again, the saving sovereignty of Christ and becoming his disciple. So when we talk about God, conversion means accepting by a personal decision. I mean, I choose God. God has chosen us, we know that. But I got to choose him back. Conversion only happens when I choose, when I consent. If it's one-sided, it, it's not the full expression of, of a relationship. So how do we choose? So how do we go about this? In paragraph 1627 it says, Consent consists in a human act by which the parties mutually give themselves to each other. I take you to be my wife. I take you to be my husband. This consent that binds the spouses to each other finds its fulfillment in the two becoming one. Meaning, the human... Okay, I want to break this up, this passage up. So we'll start off with human act. The first thing that's said there is that the consent consists in a human act. What we see in marriage, a very um, you know, sacramental experience of God, there's a human act that happens there. And so I want to talk a little bit about this human act, and I'd like to actually go back to, again, the catechism in, um, in the chapter where it talks about man's response to God. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, passage. By his revelation, the invisible God, from the fullness of his love, addresses men as his friend and moves among them in order to invite and receive them into his own company. So God moves in our company. He's come. The, the incarnation. He's here. What is the adequate response to this invitation, meaning Jesus coming into the world? And he says, by faith man completely submits his intellect and his will to God. With this whole being, man gives his assent to God, the revealer. Sacred scripture calls this human response to God, the author of revelation, the obedience of faith. Now, very quickly, Sherry Waddell talks about uh, virtuous fidel, uh, fide. Basically, it's a capacity to believe. Okay, we've been at baptism. We've been, been given the, the capacity to believe. But he, she said it's necessary. The church, church talk to, talks about the acta actus fidei, which is an act of personal faith. Meaning, we, our human response to it. God says, "I love you." We have to respond and say, "I love you back." That we we have a role to play here. It's not just proclamation, it's a role we're learning from the church. So what is the human act leading to relationship and conversion? I would say it's the activation of free will. So how do we get people to respond? How do they respond? It's to invite them to act upon their free will, the gift we were given at the beginning. The greatest gift. We know the free will is that gift that God, we are given to enable us to choose between one thing and the other. So, here's the key. What are we acting our free will to? Like, what, what are we, like, because you're not just, we're just not kind of um, robots or uh, forced to kind of, uh, you know, just move and say, okay, I'll do that, I'll do this, you know. No, activating our, our free will, we have to know what we're activating it to. Like we have to use our intellect, our spirit, our whole being has to have, have to jump in here. But we have to know what we're jumping into. And so what we're learning here, and uh, it comes from the directory of the U.S. bishops on, the, on catechesis. And, and they say this, they go, and it's full of real strong, um, important words that I think... Um, Talk about how we are to activate our free will. The conversion is the acceptance of a personal relationship with Christ. Sincere adherence to Him. Conversion to Christ involves making a genuine commitment to Him in a personal decision to follow Him as a disciple. Now, acceptance, adherence, commitment, personal decision. These sound like saintly responses. Isn't it? Like, how many times we talk about uh, the saints, and we read the lives of the saints, and we go, they were, you know, they, they accepted God and everything He is. 
They had sincere adherence. They were genuinely committed, and they made a personal decision to follow him as disciples. We've almost mysticized these words. Do you understand? Because only Mother Teresa, Saint Therese, and Saint Ignatius know how to respond in this way. They're the only ones that know, really know how to activate their free will. I'm just to pay, pray, and obey or something like that. But really, we're invited to respond this way. When I say activate their will, the people, you, we are being asked to accept. We are asked to adhere, to commit. That's what we're asked to do. Now, how do you do that? Words communicate our intention. Consent. How do you want to activate someone's free will? Get them to say. Words express your content, uh, your, uh, uh, your uh, consent. In marriage, like the marriage ceremony, if you say, hey, do you take her? And he goes, maybe. That's one. Yeah. You know, everything about her, it's like, no, you have to say something. What if they, I don't want to say it because my eyes say it all. <laughs> you want them to say words, don't you? Huh? Because words express your consent. Are you going to the movie? Are you going? Because you're wanting him to say yes or no because you know that yes and no says something about their consent or their desire. Do you understand? I, you're saying, well, yes, it's obvious, but I believe here is missing link. Because we say yes, of course, words are important. But what I'm about to, to suggest would suggest otherwise. That the words are secondary or even overlooked and not considered as important. The words are extremely important. The great assumption is that we think that people will understand encounter this relationship by osmosis. If they come long enough, if they come to the retreat by, uh, led by the Redemptorist, they're going to get it. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. They come to Christmas, they come to Easter, they'll get it. Huh. We're making an assumption here. There's no evidence that they're getting it. Our core group is not growing. We're assuming that if we say it, they'll know how to respond. They don't. Great story. One day, my priest, great priest, excellent priest, gives a great homily on Jesus saying, who do you say that I am? And he stands up there, his homily, and he goes, Jesus wants you to see him more than, not just as a, um, uh, a social worker or a great prophet. He wants you to see him as Jesus, as God. And he wants to have a relationship with you. And he wants to know you and love you. He wants you to see him as your Savior. And you know what? You can actually know him. Not in the future, but today. You can encounter him right now. How many homes have you had that you've said, you can have, you can know him right now. He's not in the future. He's here with you today. That you're saying to your children, just believe. Have you ever had that said? He made this great homily. He's saying all these provocative statements that you can know God right now. And he has everyone on the edge of his seat, uh, edge of their seat and saying, Father, yes. That's what I'm wanting. I want that passion for Jesus right now. And so he just says, you can have him. It was better than that. You can know him right now. Not this afternoon, but right now. We're all going, oh, I'm waiting. This is what I've been waiting for all my life. And he says, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and went on with the Mass. He opened.
overpromised, overpromised, underdelivered. He assumed that we actually knew how to respond to his very bold words. I've rarely, in all my time, ever heard great Catholic evangelical speakers. They promise a world, but they never tell me how to respond to their promises. They say, oh, great, and, and they never tell me how. So the audience goes, some might get it, some won't, most don't, because there's no evidence they're getting it, because we're not seeing our congregation grow. So we're, we're thinking that they actually know how to respond, how to say, I do. It's like, Father says, okay, say your words. Uh, I don't know, because we didn't prepare them what to say. Do you understand? Would that be wrong of you as priests to prepare the people getting married if they don't know what to say? So they start reciting a poem? <laughs> no, you tell them. You have to say this. Repeat after me. Not just because we want to have a great ceremony. Those words mean something, do they? Not mean something? We insist of it on the marriage because those words are important. Pope Francis says this, Before all else, the gospel invites us to respond. Under no circumstance can this invitation be obscured. If this invitation does not radiate forcefully, the church moral teaching risks becoming a house of cards, and this is our greatest risk. It would mean that it is not the gospel which is being preached, but certain doctrines and moral... Okay, that says a lot of that. So, we cannot make any assumption. What do the words of consent consist of? Well, we learn, and I'm, I'm actually going to run through this very quickly. The words of consent consist of the gospel. Meaning, Jesus came into the world. He suffered and died the creed, okay? He rose again, and he invited you into a personal relationship with him. He died for you. He didn't die for everyone, he died for you. So, the, the, what we're consenting to, what we're learning, what we have... The words are, are to respond to what he has done, the gospel. So we need, that we need a savior, very important, that we need a savior. That we need to repent is really important. The person has to know that we need a savior, we need to repent. And then we have to have a decision of faith. We have to say yes. So how do you do this? How do you consent to these, to the gospel? How do you, what are the words you're to say? This is really important. The words you say are really important. In marriage, they're very important. To want to go to the movie tonight, your response, your words, are really important to our relationship. If you say, ah, I don't know. <laughs> our relationship breaks down, doesn't it, Tom? Words are very important. So, prayer is words. So how do you respond to God? Prayer. Give him a prayer to pray. Now, evangelicals got this down. I remember someone saying, oh, sounds like an evangelical. Are you saying they should make a prayer of commitment? Altar call? Better not do that, huh? That's not Catholic. I've been accused many times of what I'm about to say, that I really believe we need to call you to a place of conversion. And the way you do that, one way of doing that, is expressing it in words. Hey, Jesus, I want you to be at the center of my life. It's not Protestant. That's purely relationship. It's God. God, I want you to be at the center of my life. I want to have a personal relationship with you. I want to encounter you as my Lord and Savior. Oh, that's heretical. Now, those are words that give an intent of my heart. You know, we Catholics actually are very much caught up in words. When you go to the sacrament of reconciliation, you have to recite a prayer. When you go receive the Eucharist, you have to say amen. When you get baptized, you have to say, what do you want? Baptism. We, words mean something to us. In the area of conversion, words need to mean something for us. 
When I talk about conversion and giving your life to Jesus and saying yes to him, opening up your heart, an altar call of, of, form, of, of in a way, a response to the preacher um, is necessary. Just to justify it, I'm actually going to go to something that Pope uh, Benedict used. Uh, he's a Catholic, huh? <laughs> no? He's a Catholic, just to let you know. And he was speaking of World Youth Day, the same Sunday that Father spoke on Who Do You Say That I Am? But that exact Sunday, I went to the homily of Pope Benedict. And I'd like to read to you this. Faith is not the result of human effort or human reasoning, but rather a gift of God. Blessed are you, Simon, of, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Faith starts with God, who opens his heart to us and invites us to share in his own divine life. Faith does not simply provide information about Christ, rather it entails a personal relationship with Christ. A surrender of our whole person, with all our understanding, will, and feelings, to God's self-revelation. So Jesus' que question, but who do you say that I am, is ultimately a challenge to the disciples to make a personal decision in this regard. So Pope Francis, uh, Pope Benedict, is saying to two million or a million people, he said, this is an invitation to make a personal decision in this regard. So he's not just saying, Hey, osmosis, guys. He said, everyone here. And then he doesn't send us home with over-promising, under-delivering. These next words say it all. Dear young people, today Christ is asking you the same question which he asked the apostles. Who do you say that I am? So he's now saying, this is a moment for you. This is a moment for you. He's asking you. Not through the historical words, but the living word. He's saying to you, <coughs> what do you say that I, who do you say that I am? And then he said, <coughs> respond to him. <coughs> Generosity and courage. He fits a young person. But <coughs> and then he says, say to him. Say to him. Say to him. I invite you to say to him, don't just sit in osmosis, hoping for osmosis. Say to him, say to him, Jesus, I know that you are the Son of God. We have given your life for me. I want to follow you faithfully and to be led by your word. You know me and you love me. I place my trust in you, and I put my whole life as ascent into your hands. The only person that can say this is a person reading it. I want you to be the power that strengthens me and the joy which never leaves me. He ends his home. He invited us to say, I am not, I'm going to end there because I want to leave time, but I want you, uh, the rest is really important. It talks about like the, uh, why it's important to have um, witnesses there. You know, we can't just get married in Vegas. We have to have witnesses. Are, am I correct in saying that? Yeah. Yes. The reason we have to have witnesses and it teaches it, I'm just going to uh, a quick commentary on it is that we have to have witnesses so that we know it was a reality. We want to, to support the I do. That now the community knows he said I do. They, they recognized and they listened and they said, he said yes to her. Now, what happens is it's not the emotion of the wedding day that is remembered, it's the I do that is remembered. What we honor about marriage day is the I do, not how powerful of experience it was, 
We as Catholics often define our conversion on how awesome it was. If we didn't have an awesome conversion, then we didn't have a conversion. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Or if we had an awesome conversion, and then we're not awesome anymore, we're going to go look for other conversions because we haven't been fully conversion, converted. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. I want to stand here today and say, what defines my life is the I do, not how I felt. We need to move away from the emotion of our conversion to the words of our conversion. Our ascent means something. Do you understand? I choose you, Lord. You've chosen me. I choose you. I don't feel anything, but everything changes that day. Just like when I said I do to my wife, I didn't feel... Well, actually, my hands were sweating. <laughs> but I, I might have felt something. I didn't feel something. It doesn't matter. Because the witnesses testify, you said yes. Do you understand? My, my friends, and I call you friends, our decision, our words of assent, consent, matter. And they will define our conversion. There's other ways. God can do everything He wants. But we can't, and we have to go back to this fundamental. What am I to do? Repent! Repent. We need to go back to that moment of decision, of choice. When they heard Jesus call them, they dropped their nets <coughs> and they followed. This forming intentional disciples. Not forming disciples. Forming intentional disciples. Meaning people that they intend to follow him by their consent. And we're going to take a five minute break. Is that all right? Um, and then what's going to happen is the next hour, we're going to go, I'm going to go through, we're going to, we're going to do the rest in the chapel, okay? Um, and I'm going to bring that board into the chapel. So we have a five-minute break, five, seven-minute break, okay? Thank you very much.